place. Children will head to their Bible study. Kim Corns is teaching today, I believe. And uh, Brother Alex Wright is continuing his study through the book of John. And so, uh, thank you kids for being in your place. Let's remember to pray for Alex Long this morning who is struggling with some health issues as well as uh, a few others in our fellowship. The Lord allows, is allowing us to kind of grow old together, you know? And uh, it's, not, uh, it's not easy growing old, huh? Unless we're like Brother Kinsale, you know, he just gets younger as time goes on, it seems. <laughs> All right, thank you for being in your place today. Would you take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll um, begin our reading in verse 7. We'll read down through verse 10. This morning we continue our study on the subject of contentment. And um, what a study this is. At least it has been for me. And I trust that God will use these words to bless your heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll begin our reading in verse 7. We'll read down through verse 10. Let's read the word of God together. And then I will begin with some questions for you. Are you ready for the word of God? Amen. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content, there's our word, with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is God's holy word. Father, as we now come to your holy book, there are so many things that seek to block the illumination of the Spirit to our minds and hearts. In this moment, we ask for a clearing away of all that hinders us from hearing from you. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let me begin by asking you a question. Be honest. What is your view of trials, of difficulties, of afflictions in your life? Uh, let me narrow that down just a little bit. Uh, if a recorder was placed in your mind and uh, to record, if you will, your emotions, your thoughts during times of affliction, what kind of words would appear in your word cloud, if you will, above your head? What, what, what words would appear that, that describes how you feel and how you think about trials? I'm going to write them down as you give them to me. Shall I ask the question again? So when storms come into your life, what are some of your thoughts or feelings about those storms? 
Steve said interruptions. That's how you see them. As interruptions. Judy, you mentioned something. Oh, you were just... Oh no, okay. <laughs> I think, oh no. <laughs> is that a fee is that a is that a, a feeling? A feeling of Oh no. Um f- fear? Yeah, shock. Shock, okay. When trials come, yes. <laughs> That's the question that comes to your mind. How long, Lord? How long? That's a good biblical uh, question that comes out of the Psalms. How long, Lord? How long? Yes, Marty. My urgent need of the Lord. Okay. So when that trial comes, you say, oh, I need you, Lord. Hmm. And it's a learned behavior. Okay. So Yeah, but initially when it comes, initially, mm, and in that weakness, that's one of the feelings that you experience, in that weakness, there's a sense of urgency to say, oh, Lord, I need you. Good, okay. Be honest now. What are some of the thoughts or feelings that come to your mind when a storm comes? Yes, Mm. <laughs> mm. Okay. Here we go again. Now, what would describe that question? What feeling would describe that question? Here we go again. Could be frustration. Okay. Okay. All right. That's legit. What are some of the thoughts and feelings that you have when that storm comes? Now, be honest. Confession is good for the soul. Yes, Greg. <laughs> okay. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Yes. Yeah. Because the flesh, you know, the flesh is raging at that point and wanting to react naturally and carnally. And yet inside, the Spirit is helping you, holding you, right? Restraining you. But the flesh is, okay, all right. What are some of the thoughts and feelings that you have when a storm comes, honestly? Someone said, angered. Hmm. Yeah, um, explain a little bit, but I, I, know, I totally agree. Explain what kind of uh, anger at... Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because if we could fix those things right away, we'd, we'd take care of it. And sometimes uh, we, ju- we just can't. Most of the time we can't. And there's a sense of frustration, anger. Um, and that's, that's a real legit emotion. Yes, I saw another hand. Why me? <laughs> why me? Yeah. Lord, what, why me? What did I do here? <laughs> okay. That's a legitimate uh, um, thought that comes, you know. For us, in the middle of a trial, yes, you know, why me? What have I done? Um, that kind of thing. Yes, Linda. Um, just wanting to use my own power. To, to, to mm-hmm. to yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I sometimes find myself wondering, like the uh, three men in the firing furnace. They knew God could save them, but they didn't presume that He would. Mm-hmm. I asked myself. Lord, are you going to save me through this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's legit. I know, mm-hmm. I know you're able, Lord, but will you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. And with the chronic stone, I experience all 
availability of that, that accommodation in so mm. to the end because you know it's not going away. Mm. Yeah. So how can you go through all the emotions? Yeah. Accommodation. Hmm. That's what the chronic one. Well, you've, you've walked the Christian journey long enough. You know, brother, you've been through those storms. You've been a Christian since you were how old, Brother Kinsale? Forty. Forty, yes, sir. Yes, Candace? I think of like, okay, pruning of something. Mm, pruning, mm. <laughs> okay. Accommodation, pruning. The, all of these, um, you know, thoughts and emotions come to us as we are facing storms and it would be helpful for us to get a proper view of trials and then link what the Word of God says about trials to this issue of contentment and how we find it. And so I think it's very important that we lay the foundation for trials. Now before we get there, we've been held by Thomas Watson in this study. He admitted uh, that originally his study was a homespun Bible study that he conducted himself, and then he taught it, and he didn't aim at eloquence, he was aiming at divinity. He was aiming at practicality. And people heard that sermon series, and they were just so blessed by it that they said, you must record it. And so we, well, you must write it down and pass it on. And so we've been held by some of his statements. I have another one for you this morning that I want you to think with me about. This is what Thomas Watson said concerning afflictions and trials. He said, affliction is the saint's badge and mark of honor. That the God of glory should look upon a worm and take so much notice of him as to afflict him rather than lose him is a high act of favor. God's rod is a scepter of dignity. Some men's prosperity has been their shame, while others' affliction has been their crown. Now, what thoughts stand out to you from Watson's quote and why? Let's go back to the first part. Affliction is the saint's badge and mark of honor. What stands out to you about the first part of this quote? And why does it stand out to you? Yes, Bernie, Bernie. And see, our, our perspective is coming into play here. How we see afflictions. If we see them properly, all of a sudden that's going to be the foundation for this contentment that we have. But we often forget that as I'm going through affliction, especially for Christ's sake, it's a badge of honor, a mark of, of dignity. Yes? When you look at the next phrase here, look upon a worm. Mm -hmm. If we view ourselves in worms, uh, I think about how I used to dig up worms. Put on books to okay. Things like that. I certainly didn't try to uh, afflict them in order to grow in Christ. Okay. But if we see ourselves as worms, mm -hmm. why an Almighty God would even take the time? Yeah. To grow us. Yeah. Uh, we should see that as a privilege, mm -hmm. and He grows us in honor and in dignity. Yes. Uh, it's such a contrast. Mm -hmm. that in God's eyes, we. We think in God's eyes that we are a worm, mm. but evidently God doesn't think that. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we don't think we're a worm, you know. <laughs> Some of us well, say we're... Well, yes, he did. Yeah. But some of us say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a worm, and I deserve to be treated better. 
uh, and we don't see ourselves uh, really as deserving nothing but, but judgment. Um, but we get lots of grace. We get lots of grace. Another thing that stands out to you in the quote, what are, what are some thoughts that just stand out to you as you read it? It's like, oh, that's interesting. Yes, Jean, and then Judy. Yeah, yeah. So we got to make sure that we're looking at the affliction through the right lens, not for doing wrong, but obviously for, for doing right. Good. Judy? Um, well, affliction is common to everyone okay. in the world. Okay. But for, for us, for the saints, it's, it's not wasted. Ah. Uh, uh, see. Ah. Uh, See, now, you, now you're going a little deeper with Watson, you see. And this is what our perspective must be when it comes to trials, that in our lives, they're not wasted if we respond to them properly. And even if we don't respond properly, God, in his amazing power and grace, still works them for our good. Um, let's look at the second part of this. Um, God's rod is a scepter. Of dignity. Some men's prosperity has been their shame, while others' affliction has been their crown. Do you hear the prayer of Augur in, in that statement? We pray, Lord, don't give me too much or too little. Just give me my portion. Don't give me too much that I forget you. Don't give me too little that I still just give me my portion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if, if affliction has come in your life and it's not for some obvious sin, or even if it is, it still proves that God's hand of love is upon you. He is not let on in that sin. But he is correcting you lovingly. So our perspective about trials needs to clarify. So let's do that right now, okay? Let's lay a foundation for understanding trials. And I just want to give you six quick, rapid-fire purposes in the Word of God of trials in the life of a Christian. Number one, afflictions teach us humility. Afflictions Teach us humility. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 19 and 20 is the cross-reference verse, and you can look at that a little bit later, okay? Afflictions teach us humility. Number two, afflictions teach us repentance. They teach us repentance. Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19. Number three, afflictions teach us to pray better. They teach us to pray better. Isaiah 26, 16. So they teach us humility, they teach us repentance. They teach us to pray better. And number four, afflictions serve to prove us. They serve to prove us, prove what we're really all about. Now the verse that we can list for that is Job 23 verse 10. Job 23, verse 10. I want to make sure you get all of these down and the cross-references because this will prove to be a helpful little study for you in the future. Job says, He knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Afflictions prove us, prove what we're really all about, what's really deep inside of us. Number five, afflictions purge us. They purge us. 
Isaiah 27, verse 9. Isaiah 27, verse 9. And then finally, afflictions both exercise and increase grace. Afflictions both exercise and increase grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 19. Now, by, by saying that it increases grace, not that it increases the favor of God, but it actually increases our need to practice faith where we experience grace. And that's the ideal. You see, it's easy for our faith to become dull and fall asleep, if you will. But what afflictions do is they excite us to practice faith. They, they prompt us to trust in the Lord. And God uses them to help us to increase in our knowledge of him and in our experience of grace. Do you all have those noted down? Shall I review them? Number one, afflictions teach us humility. Lamentations 3, 19 and 20. Number two, afflictions teach us repentance. Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19. Number four, afflictions teach us to pray better. Oh yes, they teach us to pray better. Amen. Isaiah 26 and 16. And then afflictions serve to prove us. Job 23, 10. You can write down Deuteronomy 8, 2. Uh, you can write down uh, Revelation 2, 10. 1 Peter 4, 7. 1, 1, 7 and following. And then afflictions purge us. They purge us. Isaiah 27, 9. And finally, afflictions both exercise and increase grace. Now that's a foundation study for you. And I would ask you all to go read those verses later and just kind of meditate on them, see, see them clearly in the Word of God. They serve now, really, as a, as a place from which we always uh, think rightly concerning trials. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's dive now into the text. Let's anchor our subject in a text of Scripture, all right? When we think about contentment, we should think about 2 Corinthians chapter 12. How does God use trials to teach me contentment? Here's a key that I want to give you right up front. If we're going to unlock the treasures that are in this text, we must understand that the thorn in the flesh that Paul is speaking of in this text is not just about allowed sufferings, but they are about appointed sufferings. That's the key to understanding Paul's thorn in the flesh. These are not just things that God allows. These are things that God, what? Appoints. Now this seems to be the hardest obstacle for us to overcome in our minds as Christians, is it not? A suffering is difficult for anyone. A suffering of any kind is difficult. But to think that God appointed, that God arranged, that God scheduled, that God decided and assigned and preordained and decreed that you would have this particular hardship at this particular time. Well, that, that tests our whole view of God's nature. I mean, does God appoint Difficulties? Do you believe that? Yes, 
As we approach the context of this uh, passage in 2 Corinthians 12, I want you to be on the lookout for several truths. One thing I want you to be on the lookout for is how false servants, false servants can be distinguished from true servants by what they boast in. This is actually one of the key truths in this text and its context that false servants can be distinguished from true servants by what they boast in. The second thing that I want you to be on the lookout for as we study this passage is that spiritual blessings can lead to spiritual pride. Oh yes, spiritual blessings can lead to spiritual pride. And all of the blessings that we're speaking of in Paul's life were related to spiritual blessings. What blessings were they? These revelations. These revelations. He mentions them. Do you see it's spoken of in verse 1? Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to what? Visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, how many revelations did Paul have? Now, we're not talking about illumination from the Holy Spirit to write scripture, but we're actually speaking of personal visitations from the glorified Christ. Personal revelations. How many did Paul have? You say six? You count six? It's in my footnotes. Gotcha. I, if it's in your footnotes, then it must be inspired. <laughs> four to six, four to six would be true. Now, you have a, a six as a footnote from the MacArthur Study Bible, okay. Four to six, you could say, were personal visitations from Jesus himself. Now, think about that for a second. Wouldn't it be a blessing to have a personal visitation from Jesus? To you, where he speaks your name, he allows you to see him, to hear him, clearly, not through the medium of his word, but I mean speaking straight to you. Just think about what that would do to you if you could just have one visitation from the glorified Christ. I tell you, we'd be excited first. I know that for sure, right? I mean, would you, wouldn't you be jacked up, pumped up about the fact that everything you've heard and known to be true, now you've had this experience, this experience where, <laughs> no, you saw him. You heard him. Now, how would that lead to pride? Pride. Yeah. So the preacher is up here preaching the word of God to you, and you can say, well, what does he know? You know, he hasn't had a personal visitation from the Lord like I have, you know. And, and someone's trying to correct you about something, and you say, well, you know, I, I appreciate that, but you know, I have seen the Lord myself. Have you? <laughs> Yeah, why, why me? He, you don't personally reveal yourself to others, others in the same way. Why me? Mm. So spiritual blessings can, in fact, lead to spiritual pride. Number three, be on the lookout for this, that God gives relief and reassurance in our difficulty. All right? And just underline and circle the word in. He gives rest and reassurance in the difficulty. Last but not least, be on the lookout for this truth as we study together that weaknesses are means of glorifying the Lord Jesus. Amen? Weaknesses are. We say we want to glorify the Lord, right? I mean, we talk that way all the time in Christian circles. You know, I just want to glorify the Lord. I just want to live for the Lord's glory. Well, what if the Lord says, okay, 
I'm going to let you live for my glory by granting you and showing you how weak you are. Do you still want to glorify him? Do you still want to live for him? Hmm. All right, let's come to the text. The background of this text is in chapter 11. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's just kind of survey chapter 11 real quickly. Paul begins in verse 1 by saying that I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Chapter 11, verse 1. For indeed you are bearing with me, verse 2. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed to you one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Now he puts his finger on what was taking place right there in the church. Verse 4. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, and you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Now Paul is speaking in sarcasm, but he is talking about the problem in the church. The problem had to do with these super apostles, these false teachers who were coming along and teaching a different gospel of a different Jesus with a different spirit. What was that spirit? It was the spirit of exploitation. That was the spirit in which they were teaching. They were seeking to exploit the Corinthians. And Paul was seeking to protect them. He was seeking to lead them to Christ. Well, they boasted in their authority. They claimed to be true workers. Let your eyes drop down to verse 13. For such men are what? They're false apostles. What are they? Deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Verse 14, no wonder, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. And so he puts his finger right on this false group of Christians and leaders who had infiltrated the church. They were seeking to undermine the apostles' apostolic authority. They had not been duly called and authorized by the Lord. And Paul was seeking to protect the church. Now, you know, this happens today. This happens today where people come into the church and they look on the surface as if they are just a willing worker, a consistent worker, but over time they start to undermine uh, the gospel in the church. They start to undermine the leadership of the church. And that happens, so don't be surprised when it happens here. It has in the past, it will happen again. Paul does something. He defends his calling, he protects the church, but he also does something that for him is a very uncomfortable thing. He starts to boast in something other than Christ. You see, Paul's entire ministry was about boasting in Jesus. But now he says, I gotta do something foolish here. I have to start boasting now in my weaknesses so that you may see Christ and me. These false teachers, they're not boasting in their weaknesses. They're boasting in their gifts and their calling. I'm going to boast about my weakness so that you might recognize Christ is living in me. He was really uncomfortable with that. Read chapter 11. He'll spell that out. Now with that backdrop in mind, Paul says, I want to show you how contentment can be learned during afflictions. And we're going to frame our study around three primary truths. First, we're going to consider the revelation of his glory. That's in verses 1 through 6, actually. 
secondly, we're going to consider the intervention of God. That's in verses 7 through 9. And then finally, we're going to speak about the transformation of grace in verse 10. Now, you said, Pastor, why do you give us these outlines here? I give you these outlines because these outlines should flow right from the text so that we think carefully about the scripture. I'm trying to frame your thinking in the context of the Bible, okay? So I'm not trying to read an outline into the Bible. I'm taking it right from what we see here. So let's look at first the revelation of glory. Are you all ready? Verses 1 through 4. Now what is clear about the vision and the revelations? Verses 1 through 4. What is clear is this. Number one, the personal sender is which person of the Godhead? The personal sender is Jesus. Verse 1, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. The word of there can be translated from, from the Lord. The Lord who? The Lord Jesus. Secondly, we discover that the privileged recipient is Paul himself. We find this out in verse 2. I know a man in Christ whom 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Now, how do we know that's Paul? How do we know? Turn with me, with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, and then chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, prove that Paul is actually speaking of himself. Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12. You all got it? Okay, let me have Brother Greg Bishop to read verse 11 and 12. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Mark from the rear. I'm sorry, not Revelation, Galatians 2. Galatians 2, verses 1 and 2, I'm sorry. So now back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The person that he is speaking of who 14 years ago received a revelation, he was speaking of himself. Okay? Now, we've seen the personal sender and the privileged recipient is Paul himself. Now let's look at the particular time. That's clear in the text. The particular time was 14 years ago. And so Paul is speaking about revelations that he received some time ago. The next thing we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is the particular manner. The particular manner or the peculiar manner was very unique. He says, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. God knows. He says, such a man uh, was caught up to the third heaven was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. You see this? And so this, uh, this was unique. Paul is saying simply this. I, I can't tell you whether it was just a spiritual experience or a physical one. 
I, I really can't tell you. But it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, what was the prized place, the prized place that he was allowed to see? It was heaven itself. Do you notice it there in verse 2, end of verse 2? Such a man was caught up, and the word caught up there is a passive term. So it happened to him. Uh, he was caught up to the third heaven. Now, what is the third heaven? Well, the first heaven is the, the sky. Now, the second heaven is the stars and the galaxies. The third heaven is that abode where the redeemed are with God. It is that place where there are millions and millions of saints who have trusted in God and who dwell with him face to face. Heaven. Have you lost sight of heaven? Is that uh, some um, just far off dream in your mind? Or is it a real desire that you long to be there? You know, we all have friends there, don't we? I hope you do. Friends and family. Heaven. He was caught up to that particular place. Now, I'll make this note in your Bible. The word paradise in verse 4 is actually a, an, an oriental word. It was first used by the Persians of an, a, an enclosure or a walled garden. So when a Persian king wanted to confer some special blessing or honor upon someone dear to them or him, he asked that person to come and join him as a companion in his garden. And so he gave that person this right to walk with him in the royal gardens as a close compassion, a companion. And this was Paul's special privilege. God allowed him to, to come into the the golden city, the, the garden of God. And the Bible says, according to verse 4, that he heard words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? And if he heard these words, why didn't God allow him just to come back down and speak them? Now, you have people who are on the tour circuit here in America and all over the world where they claim to have gone to heaven. And they've seen things. And now they've come back to tell you what God has said. And for a small fee in a book purchase, you can get other things with it. Um, but Paul did not do this. Paul did not come back and say, you know, I heard some things that God said and I want to tell you about it. He said, no, I'm not even permitted to speak it. Why? Inexpressible. Or if it's words, okay, if it's a word, it could be understood. If it's a word, it can make sense to us. It can be expressed. So, yeah, but the, the focus is not on the inexpressible part. You see, that, that then lends to some people saying, well, you know what, I've received some special language, you know, from God, and I speak in an unknown tongue. And, you know, I don't know what I'm saying, but, but here it is. And they do the whatever they do. You know, you've, you've been in those kind of churches, have you not? You've seen that kind of stuff go on, right? Well, no, the, the focus is not on inexpressible. The focus is on the prohibition. The prohibition was given to Paul because everything that we were to believe about Paul and what he said needed to be found in Scripture. It needed to be found in the Word of God. So the issue is on not only the prohibition, but the issue is also on, well, why was Paul allowed to see 
and hear those things where we survey the rest of the Bible and we discover, or the New Testament, uh, particularly the epistles, and we discover that what God did was God was fortifying Paul for the rigors of his apostolic ministry. Paul would have to go through encounter after encounter, challenge after challenge, defeat, distress, abuse, I mean, read about some of it there in chapter 11. Look at chapter 11, if you will, verse 24. Well, let's begin in verse 23. He says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Why were, why were the Jews only allowed to hit you 39 times? One more could kill you. And they were not allowed to administer capital punishment. That was in the Romans' hands. And so Paul is saying, five times I was beat within an inch of my life. And he goes from issue to issue. Notice verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I, or three times I was shipwrecked. A day and night I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? He struggled. His greatest struggles was his, the struggles of his soul with the church. God gave him that, that vision to fortify him so that he would not give up, so that he would press on, so they wouldn't turn back. Jesus, when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus, said, I will show him things that he must suffer for my name's sake. And so this was a plain prohibition. And God said, no, don't speak those things. I want people to listen to what I have to say in the word of God. And then first, this was to, uh, secondly, this was to help him. Now, the main point is this. Um, Paul had a lot of extraordinary revelations but he didn't want believers to go beyond anything that he had written or that was written. He wanted them not to believe in visions and dreams, but in the Word of God. Now, it's important for us to remember this. Because people will say, well, you know, I know what happened to me. And they will stand on their experience as if their experience is on the same level as Scripture. And you must always test experience with Scripture. Always. Even your own. And at the end of the day, it's the final authority of Scripture that we yield to. Are you with me? If an angel with a 12-foot wingspan shows up to you and slaps you upside the head with a golden wing and tells you that he has a message from God and it's something other than in the Bible, you are to say, you know what, that experience may have been real, but I reject it because it is out of line with the Word of God. And there should be no haggling about it. Now let's now consider the intervention of God. And of course now you know that this study will be two weeks. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, let's look at the intervention of God. Verse seven, um, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Here's the question, why? Why did God give Paul this thorn in the flesh? Come on, talk to me. To keep him humble, which means Yeah, to keep him humble, which means that if God needed to keep him humble, what did he struggle with? Okay. So God knew what Paul was struggling with. Now, Paul, again, was, remember, one of the most mature Christians that we have ever known in the history of Christianity. He was a mature Christian. He was a committed Christian. He was a sold out Christian, was he not? And yet he still struggled with what? Pride. He still struggled with pride. He was not perfect. He still was liable to sin. Even this, this noble man of God, he still struggled. And so don't be down on true Christians who are striving to walk with God and yet they still struggle. Don't put them down. Paul was in that category. He still struggled. And to keep him from actually, the word exalt means literally to, to, to be puffed up, to fly away with with. Um, boasting of him of his own revelations he was he was going he was about to get the big head to keep him from getting the big head what did God do gave him a heavy trial now this is where I want to come up close and talk to you personally could it be that the trial that God has given to you and to me is there to just keep us from pride. Have you considered that the Lord might just be saving you from self-exalting pride by sending a storm into your life? You say, what, what Pastor? I'm, I'm not going through any storms. Uh -huh, just wait. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> They're coming. They might hit you before this day is out. If you all are tracking with Irene, I tell you, this is a very important truth. And I'm, I know I'm trudging slow through it, but it's where we live. Is it not? Here's the point that I think you want to jot down. Not only was this thorn given to Paul to keep him from exalting himself, but here's the lesson. Some of God's greatest blessings can bring spiritual pride that causes us to lose sight of the cross and causes us to become dependent upon ourselves and not the grace of Christ. Even the very spiritual blessing of having the knowledge of Christ. I mean, that is the greatest spiritual blessing we have, is it not? 
we, 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 we understand that He is God, that He has come, that salvation is in Him alone. It's the greatest spiritual blessing we have, but that could be a cause of pride for us. And, and God will do something to help us, and this is what He will do. God promises to do something. He says, I will give you the blessing, but I'm going to give you a burden to balance that blessing. Your burden may be your health, it may be your family, it may be your job. I don't know what it is for you, but when God brings that burden there, it is to keep you balanced so that you don't lose sight of the cross. Now what was this thorn? This is the last point we'll hit on today and we'll come back. What was this thorn? Well, the text tells us that it uh, was not some little thorn like in a rose bush or something. The word thorn in our text that's used here in verse 7 is a word that means a stake. Not uh, like a, an S-T-E. A K, but a stake, S T A K E, a stake, a shaft. So this was not some little, some little uh, splinter. Uh, it was also something physical, right? That was giving me a thorn where, in the flesh. So it was something physical that afflicted him. It was not a temptation to do some kind of sin. It was not like a lustful thought or a lustful anything because God doesn't give uh, those things. The Bible is clear about that in James 1.13, right? God does not tempt anyone by evil at all, neither uh, can he be tempted. But it was given by God. It was given by God to save, but notice now in the text, verse 7, it was a what? A messenger of Satan, an angelos of Satan, same word that's used for an angel, a messenger of Satan, perhaps a demon. So it was given by God, and yet it was at the hand of Satan. But notice now something about this, verse 7, to do what to him? Torment him. Now, the word torment here is a word that indicates that it was intensely chronic, or at least it was recurrent. In other words, it didn't leave. It wasn't like he had a pain in his knee, and then it went away, and then it came back, and then it went away. But it was constantly there. Now, anybody have pains like that where it's constantly there? You have some cr chronic back pain, chronic knee pain. So he had this issue in his life, and it was chronic, and it was tormenting him on a regular basis. Calvin believed that it was the spiritual temptation to doubt God or to struggle to, sh to shirk his uh, duties as an apostle. Martin Luther believed that it was co constant demonic oppression. Tertullian and Jerome believed that it was severe headaches. You ever tried to preach with a headache? You ever tried to serve God with an intense headache? I don't know if it was that or not. Uh, Charles Simeon seemed to believe that it was some distortion of his features and an impediment of speech. This is why the false teachers were, were, were attacking how he looked and how he spoke. So we think the Apostle Paul perhaps was an eloquent orator, and he did have the skill to do that, but perhaps he had a challenge to articulate in that flowery, oratorical way. Whatever it was, Paul prayed. How many times did he pray about it? We know he prayed more than that, but it says three times. In other words, he really sought the Lord. He implored the Lord. The word implore there in the text means that he actually begged God. Have you ever begged God for something? See, some of you haven't suffered enough. <laughs> but he begged God. I mean, he pleaded. Begged God, please. 
please, please, Lord, please take this away. I want to be able to serve you. Please, Lord. And the relief that he was given, the reassurance that he was given, is found in verse 9. You see it? And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. I got I to stop at this point, so I want to I give you a couple of notes and then tell your story. If you look at the text carefully, the answer and the reassurance that God gave to him was twofold. It was a provision, but God also gave him an explanation. The provision was what? My grace. My grace is sufficient for you. The word sufficient there is an interesting word because it is actually the same word from which we get the word contentment. See, contentment means to have enough. To have enough to where you're satisfied, right? So God says to him, my grace is enough to satisfy you. That's what I'm going to provide for you in your trial. It's enough. But I want to explain to you something. Now, God generally doesn't give us a whole lot of explanations, but he gave Paul one here. The word for there tells us that God explained to Paul why he was saying this. Paul, I'm saying this because power is what? Perfected in weakness. The story is told of a Christian martyr by the name of Thomas Halker in England, 1555. Thomas Halker was a bright, well-favored, good-looking young gentleman who would not deny his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And for that, he was burned at the stake. Thomas a friend lowered his voice so as not to be heard by the guard. Thomas, I have a favor to ask of you. I need to know if what others say about the grace of God is true. So tomorrow, when they burn you at the stake, if the pain is tolerable and your mind is still at peace Thomas lift your hands above your head right before you die and then I will know that it's sufficient I really need to know this Thomas Thomas Halker agreed and he said I will on the day of his execution, the crowd was abuzz because this friend had gone around and told the people that that's what Thomas agreed to do. And so he was chained to the stake. And as he was chained at the stake, he spoke quietly and with great grace to the men who laid the wood underneath his feet. Then he closed his eyes and the flame was kindled. Thomas continued to preach to those around him, but soon the roar of the flame quieted his voice. The fire burned for a long time. Halker remained motionless. His skin was burned to a crisp. His fingers were gone. Everyone was watching, and they said, he's dead. And then suddenly, Halker lifted up his hands, still on fire, above his head, and clapped them three times. 
as if he was giving praise to God and went to sleep. The crowd broke into shouts of praise and applause. Halker's friend had his answer. The grace of God was sufficient. Even in the darkest storm and in the hottest fire. This example is convicting for several reasons. But how often we catch ourselves expressing frustration over the smallest trial. How often do we overstate our problems and we underestimate the promise of God to bear up under the trial. Whenever you think you can't take any more, remember Thomas Halker. Remember his witness of sufficient grace. No matter what you go through, God's grace is sufficient. Amen? Lord, we thank you for reminding us that at the end of it all, if we find that it is only Jesus we have, well, then we know that it is all that we need. Jesus is really all we need. Lord, our trials are nowhere close to our Lord's trials or even Paul's trials or many others. And yet, it doesn't matter what degree of the difficulty we all face, we thank you today that the same promise that you made to your servant, you make to us. You provide grace upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, Lord Jesus. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized in you. And Lord, we thank you for reminding us of this provision, this guarantee. I pray that you would help us, regardless of the storm that we go through, to see it in the proper light. To see it as a, from your hand, humbling us, proving us, pruning us, shaping us, preparing us. And we thank you, Lord, that you just don't leave us to muscle it through. But that in the midst of the storm, your power, your love, your mercy, your grace is enough. And this is why we sing, Jesus, you're all I need. May we boast in you and in you alone, alone today. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. For Christ's sake, amen.